trust the manager is very important. How do you trust? One is the track record, of course. The other one is please listen to the lead managers. You know, you don't have to understand everything they say. Whenever there's an opportunity to listen to the CEO, CEO or CFO or, uh, you know, just listen to them. Ask whatever question. Maybe we can go one round, just kind of introduce yourself, our audience that don't know you, you know, what do you do and all that, what, what is your purview, what's your scope, what gives you the right to sit here and talk, right, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, so my name is Reggie and I run the Financial Coconut Podcast, uh, I believe it's the number one finance podcast in Singapore, probably the best moderated panel you will ever hear in finance, okay, yeah, so who else you want to start? Morning everybody, myself, um, I'm Amelia from the SGX Research team. So from time to time, you do see a lot of the market updates, read chart book. Sometimes you hear us on Money FM, you know, radio, TV. Um, I'm part of the research team here at SGX. So we are the ones that will write content, you know, data points that we bring across on our market. Um, and happy to have you guys join us this morning. I think that's where we try to address as many of your questions later on. Okay, hi. Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you, Reggie and all, and honored to be this most watched podcast and thank I don't you. know in how many other places. <laughs> so yeah, so I'm Nupur. I'm the CEO of the REIT Association of Singapore, uh, in short, RITAS. RITAS is the industry body that represents Singapore listed REITs. But besides the REIT managers and the sponsors, we also have all the key uh, institutional eco player, uh, players in the in the REIT ecosystem. Yeah, I think all of you know me, mm. but basically we know each other. La. I know Emilia, I know uh, Nupur. We are from a REIT symposium, selling Koyo a little bit. La. <laughs> the REIT Symposium, uh, the coming one will be on May 11th. 11th, 11th May. So REIT Symposium is a must-attend symposium for the REIT investor because in that event, you have an up-close and personal to really listen directly to the REIT manager. So why I invite them to this uh, market outlook is because we all of us form the ecosystem. Right, we are all REIT investor. I'm also a REIT investor. I'm also the advisor to helping the client to build the REIT portfolio. And at the same time, we need someone from SGX to really provide all the data. I'm using a lot of MLA data in my analysis. And also, REIT tasks basically they represent more on the corporate side, the REIT manager side. So, some of the issues that you may be facing recently, I just feel back to uh, Nupo, uh, some of the uh, issues. Uh, all the investors like us that we are facing is a corporate action. So if there are any question on corporate action, not here, not here forum, you need the read manager to really improve on it, can, can voice it out. Because that would be the collective voice for the read manager to have to do something in the industry itself. Just now, I think, we, we start off the first question, right? Just now, I, I think at the end of your, your opening speech, you were talking about like how the the interest rate impact has been felt already, right? Like how the read managers have, it's essentially the market has absorbed in Right. So, so how do you, how do you, how does that kind of look like when you say like oh, the market has absorbed in these interest rates? How is it affecting the REIT in general? Okay. Basically, uh, those data presented is the uh, open data. It's already there. So the trader itself, they already seen all the tra uh, data. And also, if you look at the the core relationship, it's very interestingly. Maybe there are some big institution. They are trading the pair. Pair means that there's U.S. 10 years government bond you and the REIT re sector because uh, the correlation cannot be so so strong. Mm. So I think a lot of things already priced in. It's not a surprise. So at the present moment, uh, why the REIT sector are moving sideways is because they are all waiting for the earning result, right? Because the earning result, if there's no surprises, is everything as per plan. And in March itself, if there's a rate cut start to happen, I think probably that will kickstart the bull run. The reason being is because there are different group of investors in the market itself. The first group of investor is more gung-ho one, right? When you look at the whole valuation itself, when you have anticipate the interest cut starting to come down, they start to deploy first. The other group of investor need to wait for the news to announce first. So at the present moment, although there's a forecast cut in interest rate, but this has not happened yet. Mm. So probably they'll need to wait for things to happen, they'll start to enter in the market. And third growing investor, when see everybody already get in, then they'll start to rush in. <laughs> so it depends on which group or investor you're in. Are you in the first group, second group, or third group? Okay. So I think that that is a general market uh, sentiment when you come to the price movement. But, but I'm primarily 
curious, like how are the REIT managers managing through this process, right? Because in a short period of time, interest rates move up, it's affecting everything that they are doing. And then, you know, they have there's this latency between where interest rates move up and how you pass the 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 you know the action down to, to the market, whether the market can yeah. take that cost. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so let me take that one. So so yeah, I think Kenny spoke from the investor's perspective. From the REIT manager's perspective, I think it's, uh, yes, interest rates are, the worst is behind us. We saw from the dot plot, the next move is likely to be down. We saw that. But even from that, the charts that Kenny showed, I think there is, we can see that interest rates are generally going to be higher than what they were in the pre-pandemic period. And that is... So far, that seems to be more of the, the working framework we are all working in, that we are living in a higher for longer, not as crazy high as we saw last year coming down, but still not as fantastic as a 0%, 1%, 2% interest rates uh, pre-pandemic. So from a REIT manager's perspective, then they have to relook at all this. So they have to capture the, the benefit of declining interest rates, but they also realize that capital which is money, is still expensive. And REIT managers, again from the chart that Kenny showed, need money to fund their business, to fund acquisitions, to fund asset enhancements, to, to, to do renovation or something for the building. So REIT managers need cash. So in a situation where uh, the cost of funds is still high, although declining, what can the REIT managers do? So I think you will see currently that the what REIT managers have been doing is reconstituting their portfolio. You, have, you would have seen more of divestments happening more than in the last few years because um, disposing of some of your underperforming assets based on, the, you know, on a relative basis, some of your weaker assets, you dispose them off, get the cash, use the cash to do something which will be of higher value, right? So that is one strategy, the disposition of assets. To add on a divestment, recently Suntech, if you follow, they are starting to sell the strata tighter outfits to reduce the gearing. Yeah, that's right. I think they announced ones, I think they mentioned, mm. right, that they will start to do that, to do that kind of capital recycling. Correct. And even like a smaller REIT, like I read, uh, I think November last year, they announced that they are selling one of their Spain offices. So you will see that common theme across the different REITs because the thinking is the same. They're all looking at their portfolio and wondering, where am I going to get cash from? Is there something, I mean, borrowing is still expensive. So what can I do? Therefore, like, can I sell something? If the, if the asset price in the market, I can sell it at a good price and it's among my relatively underperforming ones. So, you know, it works from both a buyer seller perspective. So that is one, the disposition. The other strategy is, um, is uh, redevelopment. Right. So you usually need a little less cash outflow when you're doing redevelopment as opposed to buying a new property. So those who can uh, redevelop, ESR Logos just announced that I think they've got the TOP for their Sunoco Loop uh, project. Cromwell has also announced that their office property in Milan is almost completed and 70 percent pre lease So you, again, you can see the thinking, you know, let's work with what we have or, or you know, if we have a plot of land or an underdeveloped plot of land, let's do something with it. Number three is asset enhancements. Slightly smaller scale than redevelopments, but it's like if you have a building, you can do better, you know, spruce it up a bit, add a few additional wings, make it a bit more modern, maybe add some green and sustainability features, uh, then, you know, it can command better rent and that can help the revenue and net, net property income. So is, is it true? Like with ESG features, greener, then you can command better. That, okay, so that is actually a very, I mean, that's a topic unto yeah, itself, but yeah. the short answer is that in nowadays, uh, especially if you have bigger multinational tenants, they have their own requirements of being in buildings which have certain green features because they have their own sustainability targets. So if as a provider of space, which is what REIT managers are, if, our, if the, the buildings are not up to the level that they are expecting in terms of the green or sustainability features, you know, we won't even be in the shortlist. You know, you have, they, they will first go through their checklist and see, does it have this? Does it have the chillers are like this? Is the aircon like this? Is that this? Like, you know, they chuck, chuck, chuck. Then you... Check all the boxes, then we then we talk about rent, then we negotiate. So just to be, you know, in the pool of being considered, that's important. So and in fact, a lot of the redevelopment or asset enhancements that's happening is actually happening very specifically with that lens in mind. You know, because whether they command a premium immediately or not, the hope is that they will. 
Over time, they certainly will. But for sure, you can say if they don't, then they're out. They're they will be rate. close to stranded. So, so that is very important. So yes, interest rates coming down. It's an exciting time. I think you know the cost of funding, the cost of refinancing will be lower this year compared to last year. But rates probably likely to be higher. Actually, there's one more thing rate manager do. I always don't like it. Release more, sh- more, more, uh, more distribution. <laughs> more, no, no, no. Uh, more units. <laughs> right issue. <laughs> right. So recently, uh, elite com- uh, commercial rate basically the issue right to reduce the gearing. It depends on what is what, what you're looking at. If they are issued the right to raise more fund to pay down on that, the interest cost will come down. Right. That will help in the long term dividend payout. But as an investor, we don't like it like, because we have to fork out money. By the way, uh, OUE uh, commercial rate already changed him to OUE rate. I already update my 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 analysis already. I'm not sure whether SGS has updated or not. I will make sure we update our. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure they're the first la. Okay, okay. Yeah, fair, but actually, fair. one more thing that REIT managers are also doing, right, when it comes to ma- uh, managing interest rates, is also their own sort of cost of debt. So if you see some of the announcements that what our REIT managers have shared with the public is that typically they will try to lock in the fixed rates. And generally around, I think, 70 to 75% of our REITs will lock in the rates so that they won't be, um, you know, uh, have to face with the kind of floating interest rates. For example, FLCT, I was taking a look at their FY 2023 results. They mentioned that they've locked in their rates at about, I think, 77%. Yeah. And they also did share, they said for every 50 basis points increase in interest rates, what it impacts on the DPU is it will affect around 0.06 Singapore cents. So it's very real. And when we look at the interest rate movements, right, towards the end of last year when the Fed decided to sort of have a more dovish stance, REITs actually in December was up 9%. That was the best month ever recorded, even stronger than what we saw in April 2020, which was up 8%. So very real, um, exciting times like what Nupu said. I think we're keeping all eyes, you know, on, on that particular sector. Mm. Yeah. A- actually, one more thing on the ESG point, right? Not just, you know, the tenants, uh, companies that are looking at the REITs, what are you doing to green yourselves in a way? But also from a very realistic and practical standpoint, which is reducing costs, right? I mean, if you look at, you know, all these, are you using energy efficient uh, kind of products, so to speak, right? If that brings down your utility and maintenance costs, that will generate some cost savings. And if you look at some of the REITs that are starting to release earnings this week, FCT, Sabana, some of them have already started to announce the results. You see the common trend across is how REIT managers are dealing with that kind of increase in cost, right? And how that will have some sort of that kind of downstream impact. A little bit like Kenny's chart over there. Your rental income come in, you must pay out all that expenses. And then after that, the downstream impact, which is your DPU back to investors. So that part plays a role also. So, so that's why ESG also is important as, as REIT managers start to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. sorry. Can I jump in just to expand on the point on interest rates and the refinancing? Uh, so yeah, you may think interest rates are coming down. So from a equity investor's perspective, yes, everything Kenny says makes total sense because equity investors are anticipating the future. You're anticipating interest rates are going to be lower. You saw the uh, inverse correlation with the 10-year US 10-year government bond yield and Singapore REITs, so yes, makes sense. But from a REIT manager's perspective, when you see their results, when they announce them, not only this time, but even the next quarter, you won't see the impact that immediately. You won't say, oh, interest rates coming down, then how come their interest costs still so high? It's because they have locked it in, right? They locked it in when, you know, when during tough times, and they have to wait for those, for that debt to, to mature till And at that point, they will refinance at the available lower rate. So it takes time. There's a lagged effect. But to the point of being a smart investor, you already know this is the sequence of events that will happen. You don't necessarily have to wait till, oh, I will wait till the REIT manager refinances at a lower rate. You know when it, if it, let's say, matures in September, they will get a lower rate. And subsequent to that, end of the year, whatever, you will see the positive effect in that interest expense line. But sitting here today, January 2024, we know this is the pattern that will happen. And therefore, being a little bit read savvy, we can, we can, you you. know, we can, uh, we can use that knowledge and that understanding to kind of position ourselves in the read sector. For read investor itself, we don't really care about ESG, correct? Right? So, I think there's some misalignment uh, for retail investor, what we 
concern more on the share price and also DPU. Agree? So on the other hand, the rate manager is still driving ESG, SGS or driving ESG. They are misalignment. Okay, <laughs> let, let, let me, let me uh, chip in because it's a topic close to my heart as well. Re retail investors, all investors, but uh, care about share price, you care about, we, we all care about our return. We are in the very early stages of the ESG movement, but it's not going anywhere, that is clear. If you look at global regulations around ESG, countries are making ESG promises. Singapore has its own 20, 2050 target. I mean, this is a global movement. So today, your share price may not be impacted. But you know when it'll be impacted? Number one, when your big institutional investors, right now we were saying they're going through the check of the box and then some of them will still check the box and then, but you know, at some point, they will play, you know, their actions will demonstrate, will, they will have, there will be more fund flows relatively going to the more, the, the REITs with stronger sustainability credentials, more money will flow there, more institutional money will flow there. That will impact your stock price and therefore that will impact your return. So the question is, do you want to wait again for that trend to happen or if you have, you know, you have general conviction that this is the way things are going to move, then you position yourself in those REITs that you look, you see are working hard to improve on their sustainability. And it's also not, again, to make another finer point, it's not just those who already have the, the best green buildings or the green mark buildings today. It is those also those who are working towards, you know, in a, in a very concerted way, working towards improving the sustainability credentials because institutional investors value those kinds of companies who are making a sincere effort to improve. So if this is the pattern that's going to happen, we know it's going to happen. Timing is difficult to say, but it's, ha you know, then again, you know, we can be smart about it and, uh, you know, we can position ourselves with those REITs who are being, taking actions which are, makes sense from a sustainability lens. So as I say, like do redevelopment, but add the green stuff to it so that, you know, you're, you're building, you have a green certified building and so forth. So yeah. does that uh, partly yeah, yeah. answer? But, but by the way, uh, I'm tracking the ESG. Although I ask this question. <laughs> you, you will get to see more. Maybe I ask Kenny a question <laughs> and I also <laughs> ask the audience a question. <laughs> have you guys heard of the UOV Green Re ETF? The one that is listed on SGX? For those invested in it, why are y'all invested in it? Is it because y'all don't care about ESG? Or maybe not, right? So actually, on, on two lenses, la, what I would say is when it comes to ESG, um, number one is, yes, it starts off with institutional investors. Uh, investors in US, Europe, they are the ones that are quite far ahead, right? They are very advanced in this space. Asia, okay, we got to be very, we also got to acknowledge that we are a little behind that, but we are slowly picking up within Asia. Our investors are also smart. Right over time, every company that is listed on the SGX, you got to do a few things. Right, number one, you got to publish your annual report every year. Not just that, you got to publish your sustainability report every year. And this year, starting this year, climate reporting is also mandatory. So if the stress, huh? huh? A lot of things to report. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Listed company, ma. Yeah. You're you're public for a reason. You yes, got to yes, be very yes. transparent, and you got to disclose to investors, right? So if you are not able to disclose that kind of you know messaging and what are you really doing? Then what? How will people view US? Even though uh, retail investors, that it, it takes time to learn like what ESG ratings mean and what to look at. But this is the message that you're trying to bring across to investors. I think that is very important, right? And the second thing is when it comes to sustainability. Now you see a lot of our REITs they are getting some of these sustainability linked loans, green loans. That helps with that financing also. And, and typically, these sustainability link loans will come with certain KPIs. For example, if you are able to bring certain environmental metrics down, set certain targets, and you reach that, that is when the bank will then issue you this kind of green uh, loans or sustainability link loans. And then you can use that funding for your own internal either asset enhancements or you can do acquisitions with that. And that really helps with the whole you know, financing route for the REIT. So there are benefits also when, you, when it comes to that. Fair, fair, fair. Just to clarify, although just now I say I don't care, but I'm fully in because I'm SGX trainer. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. And you are read savvy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Very good. Yeah. So another thing I want to be savvy about is essentially financing, you know, and, and you, you start to see more and more properties. In, in fact, you will say that most of the REITs in Singapore today have foreign properties, right? And sometimes their financing composition is quite complicated. Right, they have some facility here, they have some facility in the US, in China, in different different places, and then they take their debt financing is, is kind of like everywhere also on some level, right? So 
I, I want to know as a retail investor, like how do I look at this thing, right? Like these companies are, these entities are now having more and more complicated structures, you know? So how do I evaluate it? Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka your chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. Uh, so maybe from an outsider's lens, it may seem complicated, but there's a method to the madness of what REIT managers do. The first principle of taking loans is that you want to take as much as is possible in the geography where your properties are located. That's called the natural hedge, right? Because your properties are an asset. So you want your liability, which is the loan, to be in the same currency so that if one moves one direction, your liability is moving in the same direction and therefore net-net you're not worse off. Or So that's the principle number one. Then principle number two is then you want to be also a bit opportunistic, right? Maybe the properties you're, you, know, you have, they are, you know, interest rates in that country are very high. So then you say, okay, instead of taking fully in that country, maybe I, I take a little bit in some other country, maybe I take a little bit in the yen, maybe it's cheaper, and then I hedge. They will hedge for sure, right? So because you know we are a REIT, we have to give out the distributions, we have to make sure the distributions are there. If you do a comparison between the currencies in which the loans are taken and the countries in which their properties are located, then it will make sense. Mm -hmm. So it's not like anywhere go look around the world or oh, let me go to you know Uzbekistan and take a loan from there it's not like there's a method to it yeah okay when it comes to foreign REITs okay we've got about 40 REITs listed in Singapore right of the 40 REITs listed in Singapore the pure play pure play only Singapore property how many we only have three now many of them in fact out of the 40 you minus the three half 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 are purely overseas REITs the other half are a mix of Singapore and foreign REITs why the case, right? I mean, Singapore, when we had our first REIT that listed with us, 2002, 2003, slowly we started to see more of these REITs moving into the, the APEC region. Then now we have global REITs also. Why? Singapore is how big? <laughs> right? How many properties do we have? Over time, REITs themselves, as they look to expand, they will also need to look beyond Singapore for that. So that's when they will diversify. They expand their mandate to diversify into other markets. They expand their mandate to diversify into other segments also. This is all part of them diversifying. And over time, we do have a lot of our REITs that are growing, getting larger and larger. For example, Maple Tree, some of our Capital Land REITs, so on and so forth. They've started to expand their mandate. And in terms of returns for shareholders, I'm sure there are also some of these returns that shareholders will see over time because many of these acquisitions are also DPU accretive as they slowly expand overseas. But of course, for investors, when you are looking at these kind of overseas REITs, right, there are also some considerations to look at, right? Number one is, which market is the REIT invested in? What kind of mandate? Is it a single market or is it a mix of Singapore plus some of the APEC markets? Second thing is, what kind of property segment is it? Is it data center, student accommodation, uh, self-storage hub, hospitality, so on and so forth, right? And the third one typically people will look at is also the sponsor in this case. Why is the sponsor important? Because the sponsor will then help to provide maybe pipeline down the road for the REIT to then acquire more assets. And then of course, on an operating level, there are certain things to look at building on what Nupu mentioned, the operating metrics, like who are the tenants, the lease, is it longer, shorter? Um, how are their debt structure like? Um, in terms of how are they managing their asset? Is the REIT manager on the ground? For example, Cromwell. Cromwell, they've got a lot of the properties across Europe. They actually also have their setup over there where they have the management officers set up because they want to be on the ground. They want to build net uh, relationships with their tenants and network. So that is them sort of tapping into that space to, to be familiar with the markets. Right, so these are things that in you know in, as investors, even myself, you know, when investing into the REIT, these are things considerations that I would look at as well. Fair, fair. Yeah. Any last things you wanna add on that? Because you know, REIT manager will sell me Goyo, right? Always sell me the dream. Wow, we are gonna do this, this. But that is their job, ah, right? Yeah. But you as an investor, like, what what do you think about? Okay, if any investor just go too detail, uh, do that do the REIT manager job, ah, right? I think that you must well work for them. <laughs> Right, so so when we select a read for me, uh, I just want to make my uh, analysis easier. I don't want to become analysis paralysis. The more you analyze and scrutinize what they do, you go cra go crazy. Anyone of you know that uh, which read has the most complex debt structure? They have a debt in Korean won, USD, SGD, 
Malaysia Ringgit, Hong Kong Dollar, and also India Rupee. Anyone can guess? Maple Tree Logistic Trust. Okay, you just look at it. There are so many currency pair. How the read uh, the CFO go and deal with it, right? Because you'll be collecting rental on the local currency. Your debt will be a local currency. But eventually, they have to pay us a dividend, uh, MLT, uh, pay us in Sing dollar. You just look at it, it's so crazy. We, we cannot, no way for us to really screen us every uh, single thing they do. Uh. Basically, we just have to trust them. Let them do the job because they are paid to do their job, right? So I think yeah, this is our so, view. Yeah, so just to add, so but again, it, you just validated what I said because Maple Tree Logistics Trust, Trust is in all, I think in all the countries that you mentioned, they are in, in, you know, including India more recently. So they are there in those countries, they have taken local loans in those countries and totally agree. Trust the manager is very important. How do you trust? One is the track record, of course. The other one is please listen to the REIT managers. You know, you don't have to understand everything they say, but you know, maybe you, you know, over over the years of experience, you can kind of read people, kind of get a sense when they answer questions, you know, how deep do they go? You know, and so whenever there's an opportunity to listen to the CEO, CEO or CFO, or uh, you know, just listen to them, uh, ask whatever questions. And so maybe if I don't mind a little plug. <laughs> Send them so, on my show. Symposium. They got a lot of time. No, Reed Symposium, of course, is one is the best. The, the, your one day of Reeds after this that is will be very well spent. 11th May, Suntech City. Uh, tickets not yet out yet, but uh, it's very nominal. But whenever it happens, whenever the tickets are on sale. Uh, we also have uh, do webinars, very convenient lunchtime webinars uh, with the help of SGX, where our Reed CEOs uh, will present. They'll go through their, their presentation slides. We have pigeonhole. You can answer your questions. It's all nameless, faceless. So you ask behind, sitting behind your desk, ask your question, they will answer. And then over time, kind of maybe, you know, few areas or, re or reads that are kind of a bit more interesting to you, just try to follow the, you know, not only the, you know, the stock price and all that, follow the management, listen to what they are saying, just quickly go through their press release, see if it's consistent with what they, you know, when you heard them last time. And that's how that you will build that trust with the REIT manager because after all, you're entrusting them with your money. So you may as well spend some time kind of, you know, making sure that you can really trust these people. Fair, fair, fair. Okay, okay. Great, great. A lot of good pointers and there are a lot of questions out there. So I don't have a lot of time. I'm going to like go with the first question. So the first question from the people is, uh, what is the outlook of data center REITs in Singapore after a few rounds of key tenants' financial issues? Very straightforward, uh, this one. So... When I look at the data center, I always look at mega trend. Investor, we have to think of it with the AI, artificial intelligence, and also machine learning. We will need a lot of data moving forward. And roll out with the 5G, the, the basically there will be a spike in the data consumption. Right? So these are the eventually uh, trend that is going to arrive. The key thing here is who is going to host all the data, who is going to do the, all the data processing. You need a data center moving forward. Right, so tenant default, you cannot collect a renter is part and parcel of the game. If you are the landlord, you are also facing your landlord not paying your rent, right? or you are not able to get uh, your your tenant right. So it's part and parcel. So, but but I can see that there are many investors they are worried about oh this tenant default ah panic I sell. Mm. It is part and parcel over the long term that uh, the REIT manager if they'll continue to look for a better better tenant because during this period I believe that a lot of tech lay off at the present moment. I hope not all of you, uh, some of you, are only in fact not every one of you. So there will be a lot of uh, the, the, the stronger survivor will stay and the weaker will be uh, uh, thrown out during this, this period. Moving forward, they will recover because they, if one tenant default, the next thing is you just go and uh, look for another tenant, better tenant. And so that uh, over the long term, they'll grow back. They'll come back eventually. Once they have a, in the right sector, if in the growth sector, you come back eventually. Yeah. So for me, long term wise, all this kind of uh, minor hiccup, all the negative news is a good time to really accumulate. Okay. And how many of you all know that Singapore Singapore Internet Exchange? So essentially, right, uh, internet runs on uh, underground, underwater sea cables, right? It's not uh, in the air one. Uh, right? So so actually, all the major wires from Australia to Singapore, other bigger parts of Asia, right, they all connect here. This is the central point of connection. In other words, uh, it's the lowest latency in data transfer, right? Because uh, it's, it's distance, it's like running, right? So if your data has to move very, very far, it's very mahuan, so it's very slow. So if you want to be high efficient, right? This is the central point. I don't know how many people realize internet exchange of Singapore. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The CEO a bit low profile. Uh, this, so this morning, I just have okay. a discussion with Philip, uh, Philip Capital. Uh, they asked me, any low bank to really access a data center or not? Mm. So, I may be arranging with the read manager per group, uh? to, visit, <laughs> to visit a data center, oh, right? But, but I need to find low bank. Uh, but uh, only for my subscriber or for my client on it. Uh, right, yes, yes. Please subscribe and follow. Uh, any actually, last? actually, on this note, yes. AI is one of the key themes that our research team will be focusing a lot on for this year. You guys may may have heard like all the hype over in US, NVIDIA, la, all those uh, chip you know, bots, all those makers. So a lot of people may not realize that eh, if you go down the few layers, right, the servers and all that, that's actually very important when it comes to AI. Right, with all your chat GPT, Bing chat and all those things. And who are the providers of this? All your data centers, right? And where do they need to be housed at? Data centers, in a way. And we have actually five data center related reads on the SGX. Um, do have a look at them because a lot of them, we, we've got two specialized ones, Digital Core Read and also Kappa DC Read, familiar. Actually, we've got three others, Diversified or Industrial Reads, but they have quite a fair bit of data center. In fact, they have been growing their data center portion of their portfolio over the last few years. Maple Tree Industrial Trust, all that. They've been growing, in fact, quite a fair bit, acquiring a lot, all these sort of data center portfolios, even capital land investment also. So this is a quite a key theme if, if you look at it, um, something that I'm also watching personally, right, with the whole AI trend and all that. I think it's an interesting place to watch and perhaps that's the reason why digital core read Foreign read, interesting, huh? foreign read. But last year was the best performing read in total. I think the total returns was what, 20? I saw your chart just now, about 24%, yeah, right? It's total returns. And 2022, they have a tenant default. Everybody yes. panic. Exactly, exactly. Right? Yeah. So, so, so next time you want to invest, uh, look for tenant default. You pray <laughs> somebody default. <laughs> anyway, okay. inside, uh, inside. Uh, any data center read coming out for the new IPO? Oh, that one I also don't know. <laughs> okay, I would like okay, okay. to know. So <laughs> stay <laughs> tuned, stay tuned. Okay, last question. I give one more question. Okay, because this is another highly voted one. Last last question. Uh. Uh, what is your outlook on Singapore on Singapore REITs who has invested in China? Wow. Yeah, this one talk of the town. Uh. Yeah. So any any thoughts? Who dare to answer? Who? <laughs> they all got big mountain behind them, you know. <laughs> Okay. You start, like, you start. I independent, uh, that's why I can ah, okay. say independent can say. Okay, yeah. Help me with the, the factual data point. Yeah, 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 sharing. Yeah. Okay, it'll be sensitive. Uh. Anyone of you still can remember as cheap, governance is, is an issue. Okay, SGS cannot say this thing, Rita so can say this thing. <laughs> governance uh, is an issue. So uh, during this period, there are a lot of developer-related uh, uh, read because their sponsors are developer, they are really facing a lot of challenges in terms of the refinancing and also all the debt because China growth on the property sector is based on debt for the past many many years. So uh, this time round, I think China probably they use the opportunity to flush out all the weak one, and and also there will be a tightening on credit control, tightening of all this kind of loan dispensing to all this kind of uh, developer la. So short term, that's why you can see that actually it is pretty bad. The the, the news is very bad, but it is what it is. What we need to look at after this flush out, whoever remain will be the much stronger one, right? So if you want to invest in the in the uh, China related grid itself, I would strongly suggest you go to the ground, go to China and visit them lah. Like like what I went to uh, UK for the holiday, I really went to the elite commercial grid, especially during at night. Right, uh, the New Year Eve, I really go and visit one of the property elite commercial because I need to Dedicated make sure to the jobs. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so need to make sure that whatever thing I invest, uh, uh, the surrounding, the property is good. I think that a uh, physical visit of the site is very, very important. So that that's the reason why uh, most of the Singapore uh, read that means they have the property in Singapore one that tends to uh. Uh, performing pretty well because you can just walk down to the mall itself. You can you feel it, mm. right? You can see it, you can feel it, and touch it, and also spend your money on it. Al although you always complain, uh, wow, the car park very expensive, the food very expensive, as inflation. But take note, uh, if you're a real investor, uh, whatever thing you spend, uh, actually you get the money back. That, that, and yeah, that's you, the dissonance, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like on one end, like, hey, I, I own a fraction of this thing, but it's like, wow, very very expensive. You know, like will it circle back to me? Yeah, that's that's why that's why that's why if you have not uh, invested in any more before because you have limited capital, at least you own a toilet bowl, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can I just add, uh, you know, add to that? So. Like everything, um, it's important not to 
you know, brush everything with the same stroke, right? So yes, you know, some China REITs are having a problem. Not all REITs with China properties having a problem. So again, there are opportunities because the broad market does this one broad brush and everything, everything related to China goes down. But actually there's good stuff there as well. A little bit, you know, we could just pull out the REITs from, you know, what are the REITs which are the REITs with China properties, you know, and then just do a bit of reading. If you have doubts, look at the sponsor. Look at the sponsor of that REIT. Go to, to their website. I know Kenny said travel to China. I think be realistic. Not everyone <laughs> can travel to China. Maybe you want to invest Suddenly, now. Your travel the, plans happen in December. Yeah, all the REIT managers have to organize tour group. Uh. So, <laughs> a, so, so, so I think the best we can do is look at the, uh, look at the REIT manager. Look at Do additional research on the sponsor. Probably more than you would do for a local name. Uh, look at the track record. And again, you know, look at the prop... You know, look, you know, a lot of the, these, the REITs with foreign properties put out a lot of content. They, do, they put out videos of like, I see Sasio REIT has got like Perpetually, they're one outlet mall, what's going on, another outlet mall, what's going on. You know, so these are, you know, they're showing you on the ground what's happening. You know, ask if you have friends in China, just ask them. So there is an additional layer of due diligence, but not all of them are suffering. Some of them, there's the, the domestically, because chi the Chinese travelers, for example, aren't going so much overseas, they are spending in China. So who's benefiting from the domestic China consumption? You know, some businesses must be benefiting and some landlords must be benefiting, right? So I think that's the kind of thought process. Uh, and as I said, you know, whenever there is something, there's a bad news, you think about who could have fallen, who is not really that affected, and then is this an opportunity for me to buy? But of course, if you've done your due diligence, then you can snap them quicker. If you haven't, then you start, you know, reading up a little bit then. Yeah, in short, nah, that, that so-called symptom called movement in sympathy. When there's a bad news appear, everyone will be affected. So, of course, there are some gems that you have to identify in them, right? This happened to the uh, uh, read with uh, China exposure and also read with the U.S. commercial office exposure. They are gems. If you really look at all the financial ratio, you look at it, fundamental, they are low school, they are collecting rental, there's a positive rental revision, but how can a share price drop by so many percent? It doesn't really make sense, but that is the opportunity. So, movement in sympathy is very important. When the bad news hit, the whole sector will be hit. And I think we should also look at the broader picture, which is if you look at global markets across the board, right? Last year, what were some of the markets that weren't doing as well? China, yeah. Hong Kong, right? So that naturally also will have um, certain implications downstream for companies that are also operating over there. And I really want to sort of uh, agree, concur with what Nupu is saying is that when you look at REITs, it's important to look at a few things like what we mentioned earlier on, who's the sponsor, the REIT manager, track record, you know, what is the REIT also doing to engage investors? That part is very important, right? Rather than the, the um, for example, I mean, if you are a REIT manager and you have your own investors to take care of, uh, would you not engage them or would you actually spend time to, okay, I really want, these investors are overseas, right? I want them to know how my asset is really on the ground. What is it looking like? How does the on the ground color to share with them? There are some struggles, yes, but to also explain where these struggles are. And on the flip side, uh, what some investors will also do is that maybe take this as an opportunity to maybe uh, review their portfolio and see, hey, maybe there are certain um, reads that perhaps I could pick up at this this particular time. But of course, we should do our homework, our due diligence. Okay, Can I great. Just one, one last, last word. Huh? Last word. Okay, last Kind one. of related. Yeah. So I have some dates here. On 5th of March, there's a webinar by the CEO of Prime US REIT the other, uh, you know, read with US office assets. So, you know, the C CEO is presenting. You can ask them the questions. Do register. It's on 5th March. I'm not sure if the thing is up yet on SGX Academy, but on, it, on the SGX Academy website, it will be up. So that's on 5th March. And on 27th February, Lend Lee's Global Commercial Read. You know, they have 313 Somerset, and then they have an office property in Milan. So uh, uh, CEO will be presenting. So again, just sign. It's free. It's a webinar behind your desk. You can just listen in, ask your questions. Uh, you know, just do all, just do the background work as you frame your thoughts about which REITs uh, you want to invest in. Yeah. yeah, I also want to plug. I also want to plug. You plug first. <laughs> yeah, <I> just <laughs> 10 seconds for you. Eh? All these webinars that we do, interviews with the list course and all that, they're very good because that's your chance to ask questions. Questions that you may not otherwise be able to ask, right? This is really your sort of one-to-one -one interaction. Um, we do do a, a lot of these with Rita's, with ourselves, you know, some of our partners. We put all the dates and all the events up on our SGX Invest Telegram channel. So 
follow our channel if you are not uh, following yet. SGX Invest on Telegram. It's got a blue tick over there. That's the verified that's the channel. Right one. Uh, that's the right one. A lot of people try to do a lot of other SGX channels. Don't follow the wrong one. Follow the right one. Kenny also has his channel over there, right? <laughs> Kenny? Yeah, so I think follow us and then there are all these updates. Do join us. I think it's very valuable to hear from some of them. We are only on LinkedIn, so follow Rita's on LinkedIn. All these dates and things uh, we'll post there and then of course our website, ritas.sg. Okay, Star Sao Jian. SGX and also Rita's have the uh, read CEO to a public. I have a one-on-one -on -one with them. One on one. So one on one, you can share a lot more information, but I cannot share with all of you. So, <laughs> so send Kenny your questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send him the question. <laughs> right, right. Uh, email. Uh, hey, you go ask, go ask. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Enough, enough plug, enough plug. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm the last one. I get to plug. Okay, so. <laughs> So we have an event with OCBC on the 23rd of March. I think you already see a little pamphlet inside your, your little bag, right? So it's about financial wellness, talking about retirement. So if you are interested in that, please come on the 23rd of March. Scan. I think we've got discount online. Check out, or check out our website, thefinancialcoconut.com, okay? So I get the last word. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope you enjoy. I hope you, you find it very insightful. Give them a round of applause. Thank, thank you. you. Thank everyone. you. Thank awesome. you, everyone. Awesome.